Chief Operating Officer of Atlantic Media. Good evening and welcome to the Battle for the Constitution. I am Erite Weiler and I am the Chief Operating Officer of The Atlantic. It has been quite a week here in Washington. This panel couldn't be better timed and it couldn't be more important. Uh, yesterday, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who joined us on our Ideas Festival stage, announced that the House would begin a, for a formal impeachment inquiry into President Trump, promising to touch off a constitutional and political showdown here in Washington. So we're here to speak tonight about these issues and to discuss what the most contentious questions will be coming out of this inquiry. We want to talk about how they're going to fit into the larger debates about how to interpret our founding document. Tonight, we're going to be joined by two members of Congress, Republican Lance Gooden and Democrat Adam Schiff, who's chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. Well-timed, right? <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about what it means for the House to actually investigate the executive branch. Our program tonight coincides with the launch of a new Atlantic project on the U.S. Constitution. We're going to be um, convening the nation's top scholars to discuss and debate one of the most vital questions of our time. How can a document that's more than two centuries old meet the challenges of today? This series and this event are made possible through our partnership with the National Constitution Center. I'm very grateful to the National Constitution Center and to Jeffrey Rosen, who you'll be meeting tonight, for their support. I also wanna thank Gallup for letting us use this incredible space this evening. So before we begin, just a few quick notes. Please silence your cell phones, uh, but keep them close. We'd love for you to tweet using the hashtag AtlanticXNCC. So this is different than the Atlantic Festival Twitter. It's AtlanticXNCC. I have no doubt that you will have many smart questions of your own. Please hold on to them until um, until we specifically ask for questions. So we're going to begin this evening with Quinta Jurassic, Managing Editor at Lawfare, and John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation, joined by Martha Jones, Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. Here to lead the conversation is Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Atlantic and the National Constitution Center's second annual Battle for the Constitution panel. <laughs> During last year's panel, those of you who are here will recall, we had Senators uh, Chris Coons and Jeff Flake on the day that they were trying to prevent the Senate from blowing up during Justice Kavanaugh's nomination hearings. Mm. Today, uh, as soon as we announced the date of the panel, mm. House Democrats decided to impeach the president. <laughs> if you're invited for next year's panel, I suggest <laughs> it may not be safe to show up. <laughs> One of the great benefits of last year's panel was that it was so successful that the Constitution Center and the Atlantic decided to work together to launch today a thrilling new web project called The Battle for the Constitution. And over the next year, as Jeff Goldberg explains in his editor's notes, we will be convening the leading thinkers of all perspectives, conservative, libertarian, progressive, and idiosyncratic, to discuss not political issues, but constitutional issues to illuminate the constitutional clashes that are at the center of the news and have pervaded American history. And we're so excited to share with you this launch panel, three of our distinguished scholars, to model for you what it means to discuss issues not in political terms, but constitutional terms. In other words, asking not what the government should do, but what the Constitution allows or forbids it to do. And by putting that constitutional lens on all of the questions in the news, we believe we can elevate the country above some of the partisan rancor that is transfixing the nation and help illuminating the underlying constitutional 
constitutional stakes. We have to jump right in. Of course, the first question will involve the constitutional dimensions of impeachment. And the way to start our homework for this important class is to consult the National Constitution Center's new and upgraded interactive constitution, which is linked on the Battle for the Constitution site. This phenomenal educational tool brings together the top liberal and conservative scholars to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. So I can look to the impeachment clause uh, uh, and I can find our two scholars with a thousand word statement about what they agree the core meaning of the clause is and also what they agree is open-ended. So I'm gonna start with that because you can be assured that every word in this joint statement is accepted by scholars uh, of both sides. And after uh, beginning with the text of the clause, which is crucial in Article 2, Section 4, and says that the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office if, con if convicted of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The scholars go on to say that although the framers decided to leave out a uh, punishment for maladministration, which was Madison's proposal, uh, and they took out the language about corruption, Nevertheless, uh, debates remain about how broad or narrow the clause is meant to sweep. And in particular, the scholars say that those debates include, can a government official be impeached and convicted for innocent mistakes or must they have bad intentions? Is it sufficient to justify an impeachment and conviction if a government official commits acts that are disgraceful, contrary to the trust and duty of their office, or degrading to the honor of the United States, that's all language from the founding era, or can impeachment only be justified when an official has committed criminal acts? And finally, do high crimes include only criminal offenses for which one could be prosecuted in a court of law? Or can they include other forms of misconduct? Uh, Kinta, start us off with this crucial question as you analyze the text and history of the impeachment clause. Do you believe that the president's conduct in his conversation with the president of Ukraine, uh, given the facts that we know now, would meet the framers' understanding of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors? Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you need more? Yes, one, one or two. Tell us why. Um, I, not only does it fit that definition, I think it's actually a paradigm of what we might look to as an impeachable offense. Um, Charles Black, one of the great constitutional scholars who's written about impeachment, uh, in his case, he was writing in... Uh, the context of Watergate, uh, wrote about impeachment as really focused on mitigating the abuse of power on the part of the chief executive, particularly the abuse of power for personal gain at the expense of the country, something that's not in the best interest of the country. He uses this wonderful phrase, something that's obviously wrong in itself to any person of honor. Um, and I think if you, if you look at the transcript that's been released, obviously we don't yet have all the information. Uh, there's still this whistleblower complaint, but I would argue reading the transcript in context of everything that we know from news reports, it really seems that the president was attempting to pressure the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, to provide uh, derogatory information about uh, Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter. I would say, first off, that's not only a use of the president's foreign affairs power under Article 2 for personal gain, as opposed to the betterment of the country, but also that it's a gross civil liberties violation of Biden and his son. You know, we, in part because of actions taken by Richard Nixon, we bind our law enforcement agencies and the CIA as well very tightly in terms of what they can and can't investigate and what processes they have to go through. And the idea that a president would reach out to a foreign government, sort of go around those normal processes uh, in order to try to find derogatory information, I think is really rings very, very similar to what President Nixon was accused of in the articles of impeachment against him. Thank you so much for that. 
Uh, you mentioned Charles Black. As it happens, his uh, grandson, Robert Black, is a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the National Constitution Center. And I asked him to do a memo on uh, the arguments for and against impeachment. And one of his conclusions was that the case that the president violated the criminal campaign finance laws is not clear because it's not obvious that the uh, withholding of aid or, or even the possible benefit in the election was a thing of value as technically defined in the campaign finance statutes. John, if uh, you conclude and, and uh, others conclude that the president did not technically commit a crime, do you still think that he could be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors? And do you think that this conduct meets that standard? Well, so I have to respond to what Quinta just said. There are two things that she said that I agreed with, which is that abuse of power can constitute an impeachable offense and that we are going to learn more facts in the days ahead. I mean, this is largely uh, an issue that is left up to the House and Senate. There is no role for the judiciary uh, in this process at all other than if the president is impeached in a trial, the chief justice presides over that trial. So there is no role for the, you know, the, the Senate gets to determine itself by the for legal reasons or political reasons what constitutes abuse and they can set whatever procedures that they want to. I think it is quite a stretch to say based on just the transcript that was released today that we are anywhere near that, uh, that threshold. Uh, there was no threat implicitly or explicitly to withhold aid from the Ukraine uh, uh, government during this call. It is even unclear when the president says to President Zelensky, look, we want you to look into this, whether he's talking, he clearly mentions Joe Biden and, and his son Hunter, I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but he also mentions Bob Mueller, who had just testified, he mentioned crowd strike. Uh, so in the context of that call, Bob Mueller had just shut down his investigation. Uh, Attorney General Barr had just announced that he was going to initiate his own investigation, which is ongoing, uh, into how um, uh, you know, the Trump investigation began in the first place. Uh, and it actually seems to me that the mentioning of CrowdStrike, which is uh, a company that was used, involved in the investigation of the hack of the DNC, there were a lot of rumors that the Ukrainians were involved uh, in that hack, uh, that you know, in all likelihood what he was referring to in terms of conducting an investigation was not so much an investigation against Joe Biden and his son Hunter as much as it was an investigation into how the uh, investigation of his campaign began. You know, with respect to, to Joe Biden, I'm not excusing what the president uh, did. He often acts in an intemperate uh, manner. But, you know, look, let's be clear. When Joe Biden was the vice president of the United States, the Senate uh, had approved a billion dollar loan guarantee. He went to Kiev, Ukraine and said, I am leaving in six hours and you are not going to get that billion dollar loan guarantee unless this particular prosecutor named Smokin is fired. Smokin had initiated an investigation against an energy company uh, that had just appointed Hunter Biden, who has no experience whatsoever in the energy field, to its board. And Hunter Biden was paid $1.6 million over the next 16 months. Now, you know, that is troublesome. Now, I'm not, well, the Congress can do whatever it wants to, the Ukrainian government can do whatever it wants to, uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that it is very unclear from what we know now uh, you know, I, I think we are at the beginning of an impeachment process. We, we may be far from the end. There may be other facts that come out, but based on this transcript, I, I, it's up to Congress to decide whether to impeach the president. As I say, it's largely a political process, but I, I don't see it, and I certainly do not see the Senate being anywhere near having two-thirds of the senators uh, required to throw the president out of office. Thank you for all that. I hear you say that there was no explicit quid pro quo, and there's a, lots of factual disputes about whether or not there was corrupt motives, and for those reasons, even if the president can be prosecuted for non-criminal offenses, uh, you don't think this meets the standard. Martha, give us some historical context, and I do want to read some striking quotations that Robert Black found from James Madison about their specific concern over foreign intrigue in general and foreign influence over the president in particular, George Mason, the great anti-federalist who opposed the Constitution because it contained no Bill of Rights, said that uh, shall the man who has practiced corruption and by that means procured his appointment in the first instance be suffered to escape punishment by repeating his guilt? Madison says the president might pervert his administration into a scheme of perculation or oppression, and he might betray his trust to foreign powers 
And then Federalists 2 through 5 are all devoted to the fear of foreign force or influence. And Hamilton wrote that nothing was to me more desired that every practicable obstacle should be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. The most deadly adversaries of Republican government might have been expected to make their approach from more than one quarter, but chiefly from the desire in foreign powers to gain an improper ascendant in our councils. Martha, there's much to say about the history of impeachment, both from the founding era and also from the Johnson era, but what can that history teach us about our current vexations? I think the first thing I'd say is that even our beginning suggests how difficult it is to pull apart the constitutional questions from the political questions, right? And so um, if our thinking is murky about that, it's understandable because these things are clearly intertwined. Um, and at the same time, you know, one of the ways in which we um, reason through and interpret the Constitution is by um, precedent about what has come before, and impeachment happens to be perhaps to our credit, one of those um, instances that we have rarely visited in our history. Um, a number of us, quite a few of us, if I'm gauging the room correctly, um, actually um, recall the impeachment of President um, Clinton. Um, I'm judging by the I don't know, the... Youthful the, glow. Yeah, the youthful <laughs> glow. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, um, and, um, and yet I would say, I think there's a caution, right, about um, turning to that instance as um, a, a, a place from which to analogize or reason. Um, yes, the president was um, charged with a wrongdoing, um, lying under oath. Um, yes, there was an important layer of partisanship that shaped um, the impeachment as it moved forward, um, but it is the Johnson um, impeachment in the Reconstruction era that I think is um, the better, more thoroughgoing analogy for us today. Now, President Johnson, um, in the early years of Reconstruction, is indeed charged with a wrongdoing. Um, he is charged with violating, violating the Tenure of Office Act, um, a technical offense. Um, but when we look through the 11 elements um, of the impeachment, um, we see the way in which Congress then moves from that formal charge um, into um, what really is a battle between what sort of authority the executive is going to exercise over the future of the country, over the project of reconstruction, the remaking of the nation after civil war. Is that going to be steered by the president um, from the executive branch, or is Congress going to be the body that is really going to um, stitch the nation back together, reorganize it politically, constitutionally, and otherwise? And I think this is an apt analogy, or a useful analogy, precisely because my sense is that while we will approach this moment and the seemingly impending impeachment of President Trump by way of these technicalities, the deep subtext is a question about in what direction we are headed as a nation, who is going to steer us in that direction. Um, and so we will make the technical arguments, but we will find it hard to avoid the profound, I think, and they're not simply political questions, I would say, right, they are moral questions, right, that also run through law and politics. And that, to me, means reconstruction is a powerful touchstone for where we sit in 2019. The Johnson, you speak powerfully about the precedent of Andrew Johnson. As you suggest, he was impeached for the technical violation of the Tenure of Office Act but was acquitted partly because the act was thought to be and later found to be unconstitutional. But as you suggest, and as a guest on a We the People podcast we had on the subject also suggested, um, We the People is the National Constitution Center podcast where every week I call up a liberal and conservative scholar to debate constitutional issues in history and the news. And we did the Johnson impeachment and Joshua Matt said, the Johnson impeachment was brought on the wrong charge. It should have been the subversion of the constitutional promise of reconstruction. The president's willful attempt to undermine the reconstruction amendments was impeachable, even and a high crime, even if it wasn't a technical violation of criminal laws. And you're reinforcing that point. Reconstruction was clearly a constitutional crisis. And Kenta, you have written a piece for the 
Atlantic, a really uh, debate-changing piece, Are We in a Constitutional Crisis? Tell us how you define a constitutional crisis and whether or not we're in one. Right, and I, I wrote that piece a couple of months ago. I don't know if my, my answer <laughs> might be different today. Um, the thing about constitutional crises is that no one really seems to know what they are <laughs> and what it would mean if you're in one or not. Um, Keith Whittington has, I think, a, a useful distinction between crises that are caused by uh, sort of where the Constitution sets up a problem and then doesn't provide an answer, and crises that are caused when there is a constitutional answer, but one or both parties doesn't want to abide by it, right? So into that latter category would fall uh, the famous and probably apocryphal statement by uh, President Andrew Jackson, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it, about a decision of the Supreme Court. Um, that framework, I think, is useful. I don't know if it entirely speaks to our current situation. Um, the terminology that I think is more apropos is uh, constitutional rot, uh, which is a term used separately by uh, John Finn and Jack Balkin, both constitutional scholars. The idea basically being that rot is when the structures of the Constitution are all there. It seems on its surface as if it's working properly, but there's something that's falling through. The, the faith in the underlying principles is gone. And so we, we act out our fealty to constitutional structures. We elect the president, the Senate meets to advise and consent on nominees, but the underlying commitment to core constitutional values is in dispute or perhaps dissipating altogether. And I think that is really uh, much more apropos to our current situation. That is so well summarized. You helpfully remind us that uh, Keith Whittington does have these two rather narrow definitions of constitutional crisis, a crisis of uh, operational meaning where it's not clear what the answers are or where the branches literally break down because they can't uh, agree or operate, like the S Senate isn't funded or the Supreme Court has no members, or a crisis of fidelity where the president says, I'm not going to obey the Constitution. But then you introduce this third category that uh, uh, Jack Balkin has noted of constitutional rot where the formal mechanisms are respected but the norms are being undermined. Uh, John, you are a great constitutionalist. You've been defending constitutional values uh, valiantly in a nonpartisan way. Uh, are we in a constitutional crisis and or are we in a period of constitutional rot? Yeah, I couldn't disagree with Quinta Moore, uh, actually. I didn't understand what her argument was, but now I do understand uh, her, her argument. Look, there has always been tension, particularly with a divided government and a closely divided country, which we are, uh, among the branches of government. Uh, you know, when President Obama was, was there, there were fights with Congress and with the courts about uh, Obamacare. There were fights with Congress about whether he you know, his DACA program was lawful. That fight still continues. Uh, there were fights between the executive branch and the president about you know, getting documents for Benghazi or Fast and Furious. I mean, these tensions in a divided government exist. Uh, nobody, to the best of my knowledge, uh, has followed up on Andrew Jackson's threat at the time. Neither Andrew Jackson, in fact, didn't follow up uh, on his uh, threat. The only person that I'm really aware of uh, was Abraham Lincoln, uh, who after uh, you know, Dred Scott came out, said, well, I'm going to abide by the ruling in that case, but I'm going to continue to treat black freedmen as if they were citizens. So that was a certain amount of defiance uh, of the Supreme Court. But, but President Obama didn't do that. President Trump uh, isn't, isn't doing that. There are tensions. Uh, and if you throw into it the regulatory state, that adds another dimension uh, to that uh, tension. And we muddle through it. We muddle through it with, with fidelity and with, uh, with legal arguments. And, and so far, the courts have been respected. And I don't see any breakdown or rot that uh, Quinta, it seems, see, sees. Thank you for that optimistic defense of muddling through as an alternative <laughs> to crisis. Martha, the historical perspective. There are certainly two periods of American history that everyone recognizes as constitutional crises, the uh, Revolutionary War, which led to the original Constitution, and the Civil War. Others put different conflicts in different categories. Can you give us examples of the other constitutional crises you think America has experienced in the past? So I I'm going to come at it 
slightly differently because um, we began by talking about reconstruction and it's important for me to remind us that um, the crisis for the Constitution that follows the radical remaking of equality and citizenship that comes with Reconstruction is very quickly undone, undermined by the US Supreme Court itself. By 1873, um, slaughterhouse cases will be the beginning of a whittling away of the meaning and the force of the, the Reconstruction Era amendments to um, arbitrate right, um, a new democracy in the wake of slavery's emancipation. So here, it's a sort of crisis because I would say that we then live through an era in which not all Americans, but many Americans um, have no confidence in the Supreme Court um, to be um, the arbiter of their lives, of their rights, um, of the Constitution and its amendments as they were intended when it was enacted, um, that we live through a long era in which the court nearly renders itself irrelevant. It's a period of social movements, right, where people from the ground up on the local level um, are themselves trying to breathe meaning into the Constitution, um, even against the ways in which the Supreme Court, Plessy versus Ferguson, of course, is the most notorious of the decisions of this era, that case that puts separate but equal into um, constitutional jurisprudence, Americans have to go somewhere else, right, to counter that. And I think um, today we might wonder if this court isn't headed to, if not rot, to a kind of irrelevance, right, for the kinds of critical human questions that are um, troubling us as a nation. Thank you for that. You've written so powerfully about the history of citizenship. As you say, the whole point of the Civil War was to overturn Dred Scott's claim that African-Americans had no rights which white men were bound to respect. Citizenship was inscribed in the 14th Amendment, but the Supreme Court undermined it. And you suggest that by making itself irrelevant and undermining its own legitimacy, the court may contribute to a sense of, uh, of, of, of crisis. Kinta, let, let, I want to ask right. each of you, and then we're going to um, take your questions, what you identify as the fault lines in the current battle for the Constitution are. Uh, John mentioned the regulatory state, uh, uh, and I'll ask him about that in a moment, where conservatives believe that the uh, federal government uh, got too much power during the New Deal era. Uh, and that much of the regulatory state is unconstitutional and they want to resurrect an originalist constitution that would constrain it. But uh, Kinta, is, is that the line you would pick or would you identify a different fault line in the current battle for the constitution? I think right now, I the fault line that jumps out at me is to what extent we believe in or want to have the constitution at all, actually. It's something uh, really pre-political um, in terms of how we think about it. I've been very struck by, uh, the current political landscape is an interesting one, just um, in a time of polarization, there are also many uh, unexpected alliances. <laughs> um, you know, certain people on the right are uh, allying with certain people on the left on, on particular issues, often concerning presidential power. Um, and I'm, very struck by how uh, the president and many of his more vocal supporters in, in certain areas often seem to point to a constitution that doesn't enjoy the same separation of power structure that we often think of. Um, Trump has said, uh, you know, Article 2, it's a great thing, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> um, I wouldn't, I don't recognize the Constitution that I've studied in that. And so it strikes me that the real question is whether we want to maintain the existing structure of some kind of separation of powers and checks on the executive versus having a much more robust executive uh, with 
relatively unconstrained power and perhaps moving toward a different constitutional project altogether. Thank you for that. Because this conversation has been so good, I've been negligent in my constitutional duties as a moderator, and we have just <laughs> about two minutes left. So for lightning round, final thoughts. John, what do you believe the current fault lines of the battle for the Constitution? Well, I, I got to respond to a couple of things that Martha said, and then I will gladly respond to a couple of things that Quinta said. But just quickly, what, and what, I will. what the fault So one is, I'm not so sure that judges should be deciding major social issues in this country. That is a major decision about whether that should be left to the people and their elected representatives, or whether nine people in robes sitting on courts with, you know, are, or should be making all of these social decisions for us. Uh, and two, uh, one of the reasons why people don't respect the courts is because critics of the court fear that the court is going in a direction that they don't like, attack it. And they attack it saying that people are, are bringing their personal politics into their judicial decisions, and that undermines the legitimacy, legitimacy of the court, and that is extremely dangerous. I will agree with one thing Quinta said. I don't believe I've ever heard Donald Trump says that I can do whatever it is I want to under the Constitution. However, he cannot do whatever it is he wants to do under the Constitution. He has a large sphere of authority as the executive, but it is not boundless by any means or stretch of the imagination. One thing I find very curious about, about Quinta's statement, and you're teeing up about the administrative state, uh, leads me to say this, which is that undue deference to the administrative state is all about violations of separation of powers. Uh, it is up to Congress to legislate, uh, and it is up to judges to give their best interpretation of the law. The way things happen now is administrative agencies are given basically blanket authority to write the laws, enforce the laws, and then interpret uh, the laws and apply them in particular cases. In other words, both legislative power and judicial power has been ceded to executive branch agencies. It has nothing to do with unwinding the New Deal. I might want to unwind portions of it, I might not want to, but it is all about separation of powers. Thank you so much for that. Martha, last word for you. Uh, one brief, eloquent paragraph about what you believe <laughs> the current fault lines in the battle for the Constitution are. I think the debate is partly about whether the Constitution of 1787, as amended, is up to the challenges of our present day. I have been known to say when it comes to the humanitarian crisis that is citizenship in 2019, that the Constitution as it is written is wholly inadequate, right, for to addressing that and resolving it. On the other hand, you know, Eric Foner has a new book out where he has really urged us to come back to the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, and the 14th Amendment, which guarantees many things, including equal protection of the laws. Foner is really advocating a return to that as a way of rehabilitating and um, making the Constitution relevant again. We'll see. Thank you for reminding us of the relevance of what Foner has called the second founding and for illuminating the stakes in our current battle over the Constitution. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Martha, that was great. Thank you. Now, please welcome the editor in chief of Gallup, Mohammed Yunus. Good evening, and welcome to Gallup. In 1935, our founder, George Gallup, said that if democracy was about the will of the people, somebody should go out and find what that will is. Eight decades later, I'm here to report that the will of the American people on the state of governance in our country leaves a lot to be desired. Six in 10 Americans are currently dissatisfied with the way the country is governed. Only 18% approve of the job the current Congress is doing. 68% of Americans say that the American political system doesn't make them proud to be Americans. There's never been a more important time to have this conversation tonight in this hall and across our nation. So on behalf of the entire Gallup tribe, we welcome you here tonight. And now, to speak about the newly launched Atlantic Project on the US Constitution, please welcome back to the stage, Jeffrey Rosen, alongside Yoni Applebaum. 
senior editor at The Atlantic. This feels like Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> I want to recline like Jacob Rees Moggs in the House of Parliament. So tell us about your method, Jeff. Absolutely. So we're launching today our, our series on the battle for the Constitution. Uh, and, and I was very proud of that title uh, until the launch essay by Jeff informed me that this is actually the fourth battle for the Constitution, uh, w which is a, a little less uh, sizzle than, than I'd hoped. I thought we were going to do this for the first time. So. Sorry about that. I think that is the mic working now. Can you hear me in the back? Let's try this one more time. Excellent. Wonderful. So uh, this morning we launched our, our series on the battle for the Constitution, and, and I had thought that this was a great original title, but Jeff tells me this is the fourth battle for the Constitution. Uh, so so we're, we're just repeating history here. Can you, uh, and this is like a, an exam for the director of the National Constitution Center, uh, can you in 90 seconds walk us through the previous three battles for the Constitution? The 9200 years of constitutional history, you can the, do this. The 90 second test is good, and we're going to start now. So the first battle is over the ratification of the Constitution itself. And the question is how to balance the power of the big states and small states and create a union large enough to achieve common purposes, but constrained enough to protect people from tyranny. And the main fear is mob rule. And the result is a system that slows down deliberation, but does not settle the fatal stain of slavery. The second battle is an effort to efface that stain. It begins with the Civil War fighting as a fight for the Union and the question of who is sovereign, the pe people of the United States as a whole or the people of the states. And then it shifts to one over uh, the new birth of freedom declared at Gettysburg and culminates in the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which extend the promise of equality to African Americans. But those amendments, as Martha Jones said so well, were thwarted by the Supreme Court and by the terror of Southern redemption. And it would take the civil rights movement to make their promise a, a possibility. The third battle is fought in 1936 and 1937. The Supreme Court is striking down the New Deal regulatory state as exceeding the originalist constitution and its limited powers. Roosevelt threatens to pack the court. The court retreats and upholds the New Deal and ever since then embraces a broad vision of federal power to regulate the economy. Is that the end of the 90 seconds or can I do the fourth battle? That was, that was it. Had I got pause here. Yeah, there we go. And That's the I'm going to applaud that because that was a <laughs> okay. <heck of> summary. <laughs> And that'll take us into the fourth battle, Excellent. Which, which is where we are today. Uh, how would you define this, this fourth struggle and, and stack it up against those earlier ones? The fourth battle is fought over whether to revive the originalist constitution and repeal the post-New Deal administrative state. Ever since the 1940s, conservatives of many stripes, libertarians, evangelicals, Catholics, natural law theorists, have been convinced that the Supreme Court betrayed the original constitution when it blessed the delegation of congressional authority to the administrative agencies and allowed the president to make laws and rules without congressional oversight. And in 1980, President Reagan a promise to appoint originalist justices who would essentially repeal that understanding. He nominated Robert Bork in 1987. If Bork had been confirmed, the fourth battle would have been resolved and the originalist constitution would have had five votes on the Supreme Court and our understanding of federal power would have been transformed. But Bork was not confirmed. We've had an uneasy truce of 30 years when Anthony Kennedy was the swing vote on the Supreme Court. Now he's been replaced by Justice Kavanaugh. Chief Justice Roberts is in the uneasy center of a court barely in equipoise. Speaking descriptively, as the nonpartisan uh, you know, head of the National Constitution Center, I can say that the election of 2020 may well determine the fourth battle's resolution. If President Trump is reelected and replaces a liberal justice with a conservative one, there'll be six votes, if not 
five and a half to resurrect the originalist constitution and meaningfully to restrict the scope of federal power. If he uh, loses and a Democrat wins, the balance may continue. And yet we could see extraordinary forms of constitutional conflict ranging from court packing, which many of the Democratic presidents have endorsed, to a refusal by a Republican Senate to confirm any nominee by a Democratic president. So let me cut you off there because you're, you're pointing to something interesting. Uh, much of that history was devoted to the fight uh, among constitutional conservatives to restore the original meaning of the Constitution as, as they understand it. Uh, but it turned there at the end. Uh, if, if you go back and, and look at polls in 2016, um, somewhere between, depending on the poll, a quarter and a half of, of Trump voters said that uh, getting good constitutional conservative judges onto the courts was decisive in, in their support. Nothing like those numbers on, on the Democratic side of the aisle. Uh, but you're pointing out that that is changing in the run-up to 2020. Uh, now, really, for the first time in a long time, we're hearing progressive candidates center the courts uh, in their campaign pitches, talk about th their plans for, for reform, or articulate uh, judicial visions. Uh, is that an extension of the fourth battle? Or are we seeing sort of the birth of a fifth? No, it's the fourth because the question is who gets to control the meaning of the Constitution. And ever since Roosevelt, the president has controlled the meaning of constitutional change through transformative Supreme Court appointments. And Democrats were very, very slow to wake up to this fact. It was remarkable that election after election passed with people warning, you know, focusing just on Roe v. Wade. Well, Roe v. Wade is just one case. What we're talking about is the very nature of, uh, of federal authority and individual rights. And the reason Democrats finally woke up is both uh, is, is partly because of uh, frustration over uh, the uh, Garland nomination, which they consider a stolen seat, and then frustration over the Kavanaugh nomination, and a sense that the court itself may not be uh, legitimate, that it may be politicized, that it doesn't deserve respect. And that's why you see formally moderate, I see heads nodding, formally, mo formally moderate Democrats saying, if the Republicans are going to play constitutional hardball, so are we, and we will take back our stolen seats. and. Uh, pack the court. It's, it is the fourth battle because now Democrats understand that it's not just uh, a, a few decisions that are at stake, but the very meaning of the Constitution. And that's why this was that discussion of constitutional crisis was so interesting. The New Deal, uh, cri the New Deal conflict was an averted crisis. It, it was looking like a crisis when Roosevelt promised to pack the court, but because the Supreme Court stepped back, the crisis was averted. Uh, if this uh, conflict culminates in court packing, it would be both a transformative constitutional moment and a crisis. And given the fact that we are more polarized than at any time since the end of the Civil War, according to the extraordinary statistics of, uh, of Norbert McCarthy, uh, I think it's fair to place this conflict in the context of the Revolutionary Era, the Civil War, and the New Deal. So in some sense that's comforting to me because I can look back at earlier crises and realize that things aren't so bad right now. Uh, you know, th there is not, in fact, open fighting in the streets of Washington. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's a little bit unnerving because you're pointing us back to moments. Uh, Shays' Rebellion happened around that, that first crisis. Uh, you had the Civil War and, and, and the thousand slaughter during uh, redemption in the South during the second crisis. Uh, the third crisis um, also saw violence in, in the 1930s. Uh, these have not been uh, moments uh, of social order and, and respect for process. These have been moments that have tested the fabric of democracy. Are you concerned that as we accelerate into this fourth battle, we could be back in a place like that? It's very important that you note the centrality of violence in the previous eras. The Constitution Center just opened this very moving exhibit on the constitutional legacy of the Civil War and Reconstruction, and it has Thaddeus Stevens' cane. Stevens proposed the 13th Amendment, and it's like the one that was used to cane Charles Sumner on the floor of the uh, Senate. And Joanne Freeman has this amazing book reminding us that during that era, people would run for Congress on the platform, I have a better right hook than the other guy. I'm going to beat up my opponent. I'm going to cane him and crush him and kill him on the floor of the Senate. That's how violent things were then. And we're There's not. a great scene in that book where uh, a representative is denouncing slavery and, and a Southern representative stands up and cocks his pistol and levels it at him, uh, whereupon he's joined by two other 
gun-toting congressmen, and then there's two other gun-toting congressmen on the other side. You've got something like the gunfight at the OK Corral unfolding on the floor of the US House. Um, I, I find moments like that illuminating because th they show us that the battle for constitutional control and meaning, which is what that was a fight over, uh, has often been a literal battle and not just the metaphor that we're employing right now. Well, that raises the question, and we didn't resolve it on the last panel. Uh, even would, would court packing in the future actually be a crisis? Uh, according to the Keith Whittington definition that uh, Quinta mentioned, it wouldn't. Uh, it would take the president saying, I'm not going to obey the law, uh, open violence, or literally the branches not being able to function. So it would be more likely to be a crisis if, if Republicans refuse to confirm any Democratic nominees. Uh, the court can function with, four, with eight justices, as we saw when Justice Scalia died. There were more unanimous opinions because they didn't want to have ties that would reaffirm the lower court. But if more justices leave the court and the court shrinks to seven or something like that, uh, and more significantly, if the court is so delegitimized that people don't obey its commands, both citizens ref protesting and refusing to obey its command or the president threatening to do so, a democratic president refusing to obey the commands of a conservative court that strikes down climate change regulation under the anti-delegation doctrine of the Green New Deal. I think that would be a crisis even though it didn't contain violence, but history does suggest we should set a high bar. If, if we're not scaring you, we're not doing this right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal of the website. But I, you know, one interesting academic study that, that I saw uh, about six months ago uh, used an algorithm to try to sort, just based on the language they were using, uh, statements about the Constitution by Democratic and Republican congressmen. And 40 years ago, it couldn't do it. Uh, and today, it, it has better than 95% than accuracy. Uh, you can throw the words in, and just based on the language they're using to talk about the Constitution, uh, without any analysis of the meaning of those words, uh, the algorithm can tell which side of the aisle they're on. So I think that one of the things we're trying to do with this project is to rebuild some kind of common vocabulary. I'd like to break that algorithm. Uh, I, I'd like to make it so that uh, as members of the Congress and members of the public discuss the Constitution, uh, I don't pretend that they're going to agree but, but at least they're using the same words. And, and I think that that kind of vocabulary has shrunk a little bit, that kind of shared understanding. That is beautifully put. And I, when I said that our goal is to scare people, it's, it's the opposite. It's just what you said. How meaningful in this polarized time to provide a platform for citizens of different perspectives to disagree without being disagreeable, thoughtfully to air their serious disagreements, but to do so not in political but constitutional terms. There's nothing like it on, on any media site in the United States. And now there is. It's what the Constitution Center tries to do every day with our educational materials, with our podcasts, with our videos for high school kids, with these thrilling new constitutional exchanges that unite students in classrooms across the country for discussions about the Constitution moderated by judges and master teachers. But it's premised on this act of faith that all of you citizens and that every citizens of all ages have the capacity to distinguish between their political and their constitutional views, to think like constitutional lawyers and Supreme Court justices, and to reach conclusions about the Constitution that might clash with their policy preferences. Yoni uh, is a deep scholar of these issues. He knows the substance, and he completely shares my belief that our common project may not just illuminate the issues in the news, but could actually elevate civil discourse in America, which the, is why I'm so thrilled about our joint enterprise. The fact that you're all here tonight gives me uh, great confidence that there is an audience for this kind of work, and I hope that you all be reading along in the months to come. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And now, for a conversation on the limits of congressional power, please welcome Congressman Lance Gooden, here with Atlantic White House correspondent, Elena Plott. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining hey. us, Congressman. Hey, y'all. I'm from Texas. She's from Alabama. <laughs> kind of a slow news day, so we appreciate you making yeah, time. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Very dull. Yeah. How's it, everybody? <laughs> so my first question Yes. Have you read the transcript? I, I have skimmed through it and read most of it, but I will admit it was such a busy day. I was, we were just saying this is it's such a 
strange time because usually you have a lot of time to process things. So I've read through it. Uh, my general sense, full disclosure, I'm a Republican. I noticed on the list of speakers there weren't a ton of us uh, that were here. So I uh, am very much a pro-Trump Republican. I represent a district that is very pro-Donald Trump. And so I say that only to give you perspective of where I'm coming from. Uh, but what I had heard yesterday was that the president was guilty of offering something in exchange for something. I didn't see that today. And one of the points of contention and the complaints that we on the Republican side have is that yesterday Democrats were just so quick to say, let's officialize this. And Nancy Pelosi came out and said, let's make this official. The president is obviously guilty of X, Y, Z. Why not wait until everything came out today? And so today I saw kind of some statements backing her up, but there's not outrage in the street like I thought there'd be. Tulsi Gabbard, who's running for president, I don't think anyone questions her liberal credentials. She came out this afternoon and said that uh, the transcript doesn't justify an impeachment. So we're trying to figure out on the Republican side what the plan is next for Democrats because it uh, seems to be ever-changing, but the constant is that there's a contingency that wants to impeach the president and they want to keep this going. Mm -hmm. You can interrupt me at any oh, time. That's a, I've transfixed. Um, based on what you did, Skim, did you feel there was anything untoward that was said? Any, anything on what? Untoward. Bad. Oh. Um, Not ideal. I, I don't love – so, and I would tell – I've told the president, I don't agree 100 percent with anyone, including my wife. It uh, doesn't mean I don't support my wife 100 percent. Maybe that's a bad example. But I use that back home when people say – you're just in lockstep with the president. Well, I support the president 100%, um, but occasionally there are, are things that I don't agree with, and the president doesn't expect anyone to agree with him 100%, contrary to the narrative. Um, but the transcript, I didn't really love bringing that up because I, in my mind, I have moved on from the 2016 fight, um, but I understand where he was coming from. He shoots from the hip. He's not traditional. He's not someone um, that is a politician that has a, a uh, watchful eye in the way that a seasoned politician thinks about things. Uh, so I understood where he was coming from. I, I don't think he said, I'm, I don't think his intention or his statement said, I'm gonna withhold funding until you do X, Y, Z. Uh, and I also think there's a slight double standard because if you had Donald J. Trump um, under investigation and the president had a prosecutor fired, which was something similar uh, with President or Vice President Biden at the time, there would be just outrage uh, if things were flipped. And the uh, outrage doesn't seem to be there um, that Vice President Biden would be bragging about getting a prosecutor fired in another country. And there just seems to be double standards. And that's a narrative um, that plays well with the American people because it's not a narrative as much as it is factual. The American people, the average American is not sitting in a fancy room spending a lot of money uh, to hear people like me talk. The average American is at work and they maybe they watch the news, but they don't keep up with things like we do. And they don't support impeachment as a whole. And the polling doesn't support that. That's why Nancy Pelosi has been so against uh, moving in the direction that she moved until yesterday. And that's also why the Democrats are not going to put up a, for a vote this impeachment resolution. This is the first time in the last 25 years the U.S. House has begun an impeachment inquiry three times. Uh, okay, before we get into history, sure. i got a lot I want to ask you. Yeah, go ahead. You've got um, 15 minutes and 28 seconds. To talk about or to frame what you read in the transcript mm -hmm. as, you know, I don't agree with everything the president sure. says. We're not talking about, um, you know, the capital gains tax or something. This is not sort of about the nuance of policy. And, you know, one thing that was laid out, it was not just related to 2016. President Trump very explicitly asked Zelensky to look into Joe Biden um, and Joe Biden's family. Um, you know, that it seems pretty clear that he wanted aid in investigating a political foe. So, my question then for double standards would be if you were to learn 
that Barack Obama had asked the leader of a foreign power to look into Mitt Romney. Would you not be up in arms about that? Well, let's move forward and say if we were... I haven't even answered the question. Calm, calm, down, calm down, calm down. The, the transcript, if I, and I should have brought it with me, I don't have it with me, but if I recall the exact words weren't, please investigate my political opponent. The president was talking about a history of corruption that he, the president has been on a ev evaporate, eviscerate corruption kick since he took office. That's why he got elected. And the, the message I believe- Hey y'all, stop. The message was um, that the president wanted um, this corruption allegation to be investigated and seen through, and he said it. But he didn't say, I'm going to withhold this, these funds. There wasn't a quid pro quo. What he did was not impeachable. It may be something that Mitt Romney doesn't like. He said that. Um, but I don't think when you have the presidential candidates running against him saying this is not an impeachable offense, I don't think it's something uh, that if Nancy Pelosi knew yesterday that she would have come out and said we need to open up this impeachment inquiry. If asking, again, the leader of a foreign nation to investigate your political rival is not grounds for impeachment or at least a statement saying um, this was wrong, what is? Um, high crimes and misdemeanors. That's not, that's not what that was. If it was, then that's all you'd be hearing today from Democrats. The Democrats are not saying there's a smoking gun here. Um, when you've got leaders in the Democratic Party who won't even put up a vote for impeachment, then I would tell you that you should ask Speaker Pelosi that same exact question. Because Democrats, the senator, I don't even remember who it was, but it was a good quote. He said, if Democrats want to impeach the president, then they should go on Amazon and buy a spine and actually do it. Because what you saw yesterday was not any change in what's been happening. The last six to nine months of this, have nothing changes by what Nancy Pelosi said yesterday. What she did yesterday that was different than what's happened is Nancy Pelosi formally herself came out and said she supports what's been happening because an official impeachment inquiry, a formal one, has to be voted on by the House. So I would ask you to ask the Democratic uh, Committee, or the caucus, the same question. If this is not an impeachable offense, then what is? Because if this is so impeachable, why aren't they putting it up for a vote? And the answer to that question is Democrats are not genuine in their desire to do a formal inquiry for impeachment of the president. We hear a lot of things about uh, these, these uh, purity reasons for impeaching the president. People say it's our moral ob obligation uh, to have oversight. Well, if that's the case, put it up for a vote. Force people to actually go on record and say, yes, we need to open this inquiry. Maybe you're not to the impeachment, actual impeachment vote yet, but why not put it up uh, for a vote? And the answer to that question is, the speaker wants to protect the 31 Democratic members that are in districts that voted for President Trump. They want to continue to litigate the 2016 election as long as they can while protecting those 31 members and not forcing them to go on record. And I think that's what they're going to do as long as they can. So you think Pelosi in making public that she formally supports the impeachment inquiry, which procedurally, you're correct, has been happening mm -hmm. with Nadler. You think she's just bluffing in terms of actually oh, no, no, no. a timeline I don't for that think vote? She, I don't know that she's bluffing. She hasn't set a timeline for a vote. No, that's what I'm I saying. Think you don't she, think she will, though? I don't think she genuinely wanted to be on stage yesterday uh, because I think she has put it off as long as she possibly could. And it got to the point where the uh, majority of her members, certainly not all of them, because those 31 members uh, are who they're trying to protect because impeachment is such a low polling uh, negative uh, idea in across the country. There's just not support for impeachment. Um, both sides would agree with that. And privately, it's something that those Democrats in those 31 swing districts uh, talk about. They say, we're not quite there yet, we're not quite there yet. Um, but I, I believe that the talk about we wanna do this quickly, that's just not accurate because they know that if they quickly impeach the president, then it goes to the Senate where it dies, it's over. Uh, he's either acquitted, or it's not taken up. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I don't know if they can even not, if they can let it linger, but I am confident, and I think just about everyone in this room, no matter your political persuasion, uh, would probably agree that the Senate is not going to um, convict Donald Trump. So if that's the case, 
and you know the Senate's not going to convict the president, then from a strategic perspective, if you're the Democrats, then you just want to drag this out as long as you can uh, and make it political and make sure um, that if you're going to go down this route, if your far left wing of your party is going to force you to go down this route, then let's see if we can get some good dirt that will stick. So far they haven't. Um, it's t difficult to defend uh, the transcript that we're talking about, um, but it's not an impeachable. It's not an impeachable thing. If it was, everyone would be saying, "Oh, this is it. He's finished." No one's saying that. Um, but the Democrats know that even if they choose to go down that road, formally impeach the president, they're not going to get a convention in, conviction in the Senate. And so, the thinking among the Democrats is, we've either got to. Uh, carry this out and hopefully we'll get lucky and get something on him that sticks or we're going to just keep this going uh, so we can bloody him up as much as we can uh, through the next election cycle because there's nothing passing. Uh, if you recall three weeks ago, there were Democrats saying we need to cancel the recess, come back to Washington and pass XYZ gun control bill. None of that has happened. Nothing. Um, that was a crisis three weeks ago. No one's even talking about it now. Uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement Canada is going into elections in a month or two, I believe. Uh, what happens if Trudeau loses? Uh, we, do we start all over? Uh, that's a bill that has broad bipartisan support. Speaker Pelosi won't bring it up because uh, it would declare a victory for the president. No one's talking about passing any of those things but, now. But, I mean, and I a, only, big thing, I, a big I, thing changed today. I mean, we, it was revealed to us in this transcript, and you said it's difficult to defend. So, I, you know, I do want to be clear. You think, do you think it was wrong that Trump asked Zelensky to look into Joe Biden? I don't know um, the, his, the background for everything that was said in that transcript, and I will be honest, I haven't read it in depth, so I'm hesitant to comment and say this was it's wrong interesting. or that was wrong. Right? No, I, absolutely. <laughs> I've, I have not had anything to eat all day. I'm, I'm uh, actually, anyway, the, it's been a busy day. It's unusually busy. Most days are not like the last 48 hours have been, mm -hmm. uh, even though days in Washington are usually pretty busy. But the, um, the interference in elections, I believe, is something that foreign powers don't need to be involved in in any way, uh, form, or fashion. Um, but the problem is is a credibility problem uh, by Democrats because we heard so for so long that uh, once the uh, smoking gun came out with the Russian investigation um, that everyone would be on board. And then we heard that once this transcript came out that there would be some huge smoking gun. There's really not a smoking gun. If there was, then everyone would be saying, here's the smoking gun. We've got to impeach him. If it's so bad as you say it is, why won't Democrats take a vote on it? Why won't they take it up for a vote? Why is, is one of the presidential candidates who's in the next debates, she's a legitimate candidate, saying that this is not an impeachable offense? The answer is because it's not. And so because you don't like something the president did, uh, whether you think it's wrong or right, the answer is, was it legal? And there's no laws broken. If there were, then you would have heard about it. Uh, and so Democrats are now thinking about what do we do next? What can we investigate that we haven't already found um, to hopefully see if something sticks? Um, I have one final question before we open it up to questions from the audience. What do you think that oversight properly exercised looks like? Because the White House Counsel's Office has been pretty total in its refusal to turn over documents, to comply with subpoenas. I mean, to the point that, you know, Hope Hicks won't even answer where her office was in the White House. At, you know, at what point is it, at what point is Congress simply unable to do its job? So uh, the answer to the unable to do its job is the last, as long as I've been alive, it seems the last 20 years, they, they've been unable to do their job. I've only been in office for nine months. I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. I don't have a wonderful answer for you about what proper oversight is, but I can talk all night about what it's not. And I'll give you an example. Uh, hiring a special prosecutor to investigate whatever your topic is. Um, if there's um, an officer of the federal government that you think has done something wrong, if you go out and you hire a special prosecutor and then they come back and say there is nothing uh, that warrants impeachment in, this, uh, in, these, in my findings, then you 
don't disregard that and continue a witch hunt. Uh, and that's what's been happening here. We were told uh, that there would be some smoking gun. We were told what a wonderful man Robert Mueller was and how we needed to respect him and his ruling and that whatever he came out with would be, would be fair. It's unbelievable uh, to, dis to, to think about how disappointed Democrats were um, the day that he rolled out that report. Um, there was visible frustration and sadness among many of them. Uh, that there wasn't something juicy in there uh, that would warrant a good impeachment. Uh, and we move forward to today. Again, there's nothing that warrants impeachment, and they know that. If they had something that they could impeach the president on and justify, they would bring it up and vote on it. They won't even vote on it. Um, and I think it's sad that we've got a president who should be meeting with leaders in the United Nations. Uh, he should be coming from a position of strength instead three and a half hours south, the U.S. Congress is talking about impeaching him. It's difficult to have meetings with foreign leaders when the, uh, the, the dialogue is that you're being impeached. People in other countries don't really understand how our process works. They hear the word impeachment. They think that means you're just going to be kicked out of office. But um, I, the answer to your oversight question is what's been happening for the last nine months is just not it. Uh, if the House majority were capable of proper oversight, then they would have wrapped this up long ago. All righty. Um, let's open it up for questions. I'm sure you all could give great speeches. I don't want to hear them right now. So make sure you're asking an actual question and please be respectful. Hi, my name's Ed and I'm just a curious person. I'm not with an organization. Oh, you want me to stand up? Um, so we talked about the transcript. What was your perspective on the withholding of the whistleblower report, which Congress required to be uh, provided? Is that impeachable if the administration refused to do something that Congress enacted in law? So it's my understanding that the whistleblower report is going to be released. Is that your understanding? Um, today, the White House said that um, it might do that, and I think as early as tomorrow as possible. Yeah, so it's to comment on the hypothetical what ifs would be not a great use of anyone's time, but I, I believe that it's going to be released and uh, that should help things out. And I'm, I'm not calling on people, so whoever gets the mic gets the mic, I think. Okay, yeah, uh, seven hours ago you uh, tweeted about about this, you, you stated that they got the report, no violations of the law of Donald Trump. Like, you know what you said. You hadn't read it. How, how could you be doing no, I, I said I have kind of skimmed through it. I haven't read it in detail. It's but you very didn't long. read it. At seven hours ago, you no, were reading it? I think I answered the question for you. I don't think so, but go ahead. Sure. Should I stand or sit? Okay. Hi, my name is Serena. Uh, thank you for being here today. So you, in your last answer alluded to the fact, or you said verbatim, that you believe the Russia investigation to be a witch hunt and kind of alluded that you felt the same way about this newly released document. And you did make clear your thoughts about whether technically this document constitutes an impeachable offense, but it seemed, sorry, I'll make it a question, not a statement. Do you believe you. that Congress should be giving presidents the benefit of the doubt concerning whether or not they uh, intend some kind of malintent in their communications with a foreign government? Um, like, do you believe that any measure of investigation into seemingly suspicious acts is warranted? Or as suggested in your last answer, you know, the president should speak to the UN from a position of power, et cetera. Congress should step down and defer to the president and give them the benefit of the doubt saying, okay, they probably meant well by this. Cause yeah, you know. So, so the problem is, is you're talking about a body led by a group, the body is the U.S. House, the group is the Democrats, um, that doesn't have credibility with the president or with the other half of the chamber, which is me and Republicans. Um, and when I say that, I point to recent experience. A recent experience is that the 2016 election results have not been respected. They're angry, and they're just unhappy about it. And because they haven't been able to defeat the president at the ballot box, and they're not sure they're going to get him next time, uh, that they need to go down this investigation route, which they did. Hired an independent prosecutor. Um, he conducted a very lengthy special investigation. 
and didn't come up with what they wanted to come up with. Um, so yes, Congress needs to over to, needs oversight. Congress needs to investigate wrongdoing. But the problem is, is you've got a group that won't even admit that what they're doing is something that is not even approved. You've got an impeachment inquiry that's not even a real impeachment inquiry. If there were uh, if there was something actual, uh, some meat behind this, if people in Congress were really on board and this was for pure values and the uh, intentions were really that great, uh, then they wouldn't have a problem taking a vote on it. But it's not, it's not about that. It's all political. The reason they're not taking a vote is to protect some of their members from having to take a difficult vote. And also because they couldn't cobble the votes together. Back in July, we took up an impeachment vote. It failed. A majority of the Democrats didn't even support it. So the problem is, this is not a, uh, a matter of a typical investigation by a respected body. They've lost credibility uh, because this wonderful man, Mr. Mueller, uh, who did his investigation, came back with facts that they didn't like, and there was nothing to it. So that's why we use the term witch hunt, is because the results came back. They weren't what Democrats wanted, and they've continued down this path of witch hunt and smearing the president. They're not sure they're going to be able to beat him in the next election, and I predict that after what they did yesterday uh, that they won't. I'll also give you some insider information. As disgusted, we're getting an inside. Uh, an inside. Do we have to stop? Yeah, that means we have to stop. Okay, you won't get if the insider information. Then. Five seconds. Sorry. Thought you want to wrap up really fast? I was going to say this. Republicans, as disgusted as we are with the process, as an American, uh, as a member of Congress, I'm disgusted with the process. I'm frustrated uh, that Democrats have chosen to go this route, that they don't even have the nerve to put it up for a vote. If you're a Democrat in this room, shaking your head at everything I'm saying, then you should call your member of Congress, if they're a Democrat, and say, if this case is so strong, why aren't you guys putting it up for a vote? Why would you give the Republicans that great talking point that for the first time in 25 years, we're going to open an inquiry without even putting it to the uh, vote of the people? That's something everyone in this room should be for. Um, and the reason I bring that up is as an American, I'm outraged. As a strategist who wants to win back the majority for my party, Republicans are quietly loving every bit of this. Why? Because we believe it will ensure that Donald Trump gets reelected next year. And as outraged as Republicans are privately, we're thinking to ourselves, well, at least we're going to keep the White House. Well, let's see if that prediction ends up true. Thank you so Thank much, you. Congressman. Next up, for a conversation on the power to impeach, please welcome Congressman Adam Schiff, Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. And here to lead the conversation, Jeffrey Goldberg, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, and let me just say at the outset, this is the uh, uh, first event in a new partnership between The Atlantic and the National Constitution Center, Jeff Rosen, and it's uh, going wonderfully well. Um, helped a little bit by the news, perhaps. Um, but we're looking forward to a long and, uh, and fruitful relationship. Um, Congressman Schiff, uh, how's your week been? Um, slow. Slow. Yeah. Slow. slow. Imagine um, it fast. Uh, so can you just bring us up to speed? Um, I, I want to get to some larger issues about uh, the stress on uh, the Constitution, stress on our systems, uh, and, and the various issues that impeachment uh, raises. But, but why don't we talk for a minute about uh, one of the latest developments, the uh, release to you, at least, of the whistleblower complaint. Um, you have now seen the actual whistleblower report. Um, I, did it surprise you? Can you say anything about it um, to this group, about what you've, um, what you've understood about it so far? Well, I don't know that I'm authorized tonight, and this may change uh, first thing in the morning. Um, we can wait. Can you wait? <laughs> The conversation goes on long enough. We'll I'm just bring in it. snacks. Uh, it's fine. Um, I don't know that I can even confirm or deny whether the subject of the complaint involves the subject of the call, uh, because the at this point, the director has made no declaration that any of it is unclassified or any of it can be shared. Uh, presumably, when he's coming in to testify, he's going to want to be able to. Um, 
talk about some of the substance. Right. Uh, but frankly, they're not going to tell us until the morning uh, what they consider classified or unclassified. Uh, I should say, frankly, that this complaint we consider to be the property of our committee. That's where it was intended to be. Uh, and we ought to make the decisions about the release of information from it. Um, frankly, we have much more concern, I think, over the welfare of this whistleblower than anyone in the administration has shown. Um, and I don't think you know the they have the... Do you know I the whistleblower? Do you know I don't. the identity of the whistleblower? I don't. Okay. When, will, when will you find out? Or will you find out? Well, uh, presumably I'll find out uh, before he or she comes to testify. Well, and hopes. we're trying to uh, arrange that uh, as soon as we can. And, but here's the challenge and the danger facing the whistleblower, which is the acting director of national intelligence says, I'm determined to protect the whistleblower. Well, I, I appreciate that sentiment, but where were you when the president was suggesting the whistleblower may be a traitor? Um, Remaining mute in the face of that, to me, does not seem like protecting the whistleblower from reprisal because the reprisals have already begun. Uh, but more than that, the Department of Justice wrote what I consider a sham of a legal document to justify the non-transmittal of that complaint to Congress. But the way the Justice Department did it by saying in this contorted legal reasoning um, that the Director of National Intelligence has no responsibilities when it comes to protecting against foreign interference in our election. That should come as a revelation to the director. Uh, it certainly came as a revelation to me. Um, and, but by using that basis, saying this is outside of the director's jurisdiction, basically the Department of Justice has said, whistleblower, you're outside of the protections of the statute. You're not covered. You're at peril. Um, and so... We want to make sure that we do everything to protect that person. Hmm. Um, and it may be to protect her from a Justice Department that is now run by someone who views his mission as serving the interests of the president, not the interests of justice. Right. Let's talk about your reaction to the transcript, so-called. It's not, a, not actually a word-for-word -word transcript um, memorandum of the call, the call that is still at the center of this, of this controversy. Um, Tell us, tell us what you think about it. The, the, the White House released it in the hopes that um, it would allay people's fears or show them that it's uh, less than, than meets the eye. We now ha are hearing from many Republicans uh, privately that they're appalled that the White House released it uh, because it is so damaging in their eyes, at least privately. They won't, they won't say that publicly. Talk about, talk about the, the, the content of, of, of that and talk about your reaction to it. Well, uh, you know, when the White House announced and they sort of vacillated about this in the last couple of days that they were going to release the transcript to Congress, we started, not transcript even, well, though they called it a transcript, but they were going to release something to Congress. Um, we started to wonder whether what they were going to re release was a selective excerpt of this conversation, that is, as I understand how the process works, there could be many people on a call between the president and a foreign head of state, many people separately taking notes that get written up as a report of the call, uh, and that maybe what the White House was going to do, a la the misleading bar summary, right. is cherry pick the one that contains the least incriminating information about the president. Because as I understand, not necessarily the policy, but sometimes the practice, those that are writing up the notes of the call don't want to include things that are just embarrassing to the president. Um, and, and that may extend to things that are beyond embarrassing that could go into illegality right. or corruption. Right. These are people who work for the president. They're people who work for the president. Um, so I have to say I had low expectations for what they were going to actually release. Uh, I got a chuckle out of a news story, although it's kind of dark humor, uh, that came out today that was a press report of overhearing two White House staff talking to each other saying, um, won't it be embarrassing if what we release doesn't even include the part of the conversations the president has admitted to? Um, <laughs> and I mean, it's, at one level, it's funny. At, at another level, it's, it's terrifying. Um, that's when very it, Alice it, in Wonderland. Oh, that, yes, that, that's it is. That's rabbit hole when, yeah. when it came out, I was shocked at how bad it was how blatant it was. Um, and I can only think that either they were just so 
terribly misled by the president's own sense that he can persuade anybody of any uh, alternate reality, that right, they have their alternate facts, truth isn't truth, and they could spin this into any meaning they want. Either they had fully bought into that or they were convinced somebody else had this record, somebody else was going to release this record, and better that they do it early because the one advantage they had in the course of the Mueller investigation is the facts came out drip by drip by drip by drip. If the facts we knew at the end of the Mueller investigation were released on a single day, if we learned about that illicit meeting in Trump Tower and those emails where the Russians literally promised dirt on Trump's opponent as part of the Russian government after to help the Trump campaign, it would have had a completely different reaction for the country. So I don't, I don't know what it is, but obviously um, I think people's reaction to it, and now you're actually starting to see some of the Republicans in the Senate speak right. out publicly. Um, it's hard to imagine um, a worse abuse of office than this. And, and this is, of course, what the framers Go feared. into that. Go into it. What is the, it will come to that in a minute, but what, what is specifically the most blatant um, violation of, of, of the law, perhaps, and certainly presidential norms and beha norms of behavior? Well, you know, the, uh, the first obligation of the president is to protect the country. That, I think, means quite literally protect the country. It also means uphold the Constitution. That's part of the oath. It's really the, the essence of the oath of office. And here the president betrays both. Um, it's in our national security interest that Russia not invade its neighbors. It's in our national security interest that when we promise Ukraine, as we and our other allies did when they gave up their nuclear weapons, that we will help assure their territorial integrity, that we stand up for what we promised. Um, and here, that a president of the United States would withhold military aid to a nation that is still occupied in part by Russian forces, Russian irregulars, little Russian green men, withhold that um, even as he is pressing that leader to intervene, to manufacture dirt to help his political campaign. Um, it makes our country less safe. It jeopardizes our national security. But in terms of his oath of office of, of faithfully executing the laws, we passed a law that said we want this, these millions of dollars in military assistance to go to Ukraine. He's not faithfully executing if he's withholding that support for personal political reasons. So uh, to me, it, it, it is the most flagrant abuse of his oath of office. Right. I asked um, the speaker uh, yesterday if she believed that the president understands right from wrong. Do you believe the president understands right from wrong? Um, not always, no. I don't believe he does. Um, because there are some times when he will say, <clears throat> say things. And, and this is a president who deceives all the time. <clears throat> but sometimes he will say things that are so damning, I think because he doesn't understand how truly incriminating they are which suggests that there are times when he doesn't know right from wrong. Or his view of the world is everybody is completely in it for themselves. That's how he operates. That's how he expects everyone else to operate. And for anyone <clears throat> to suggest otherwise is a charade. Right. Um, you know, you, you meet people in life who assume that everyone is like they are. And when they lack a moral compass, they assume everyone else lacks a moral compass. You know, I would still imagine that somewhere in the back of his head, he understands right from wrong. But that switch doesn't always seem to be flipped on. Um, or even when it is, it's always secondary to his immediate personal need. I, I asked that question because he, he, this phone call happened right after the Mueller, right after Mueller's testimony. Um, He's not unaware of the fact that you're not supposed to ask foreign leaders to interfere in American elections. Uh, it's been discussed in public for quite a while now. And yet he did this. And so uh, it strikes me as not Nixonian. I think Nixon understood right from wrong and did wrong sometimes or often. Uh, but but I, this, this question goes to the question of whether he's competent to be president. And I want to ask you that directly. Do you think he has the cognitive abilities, put aside the, 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 the moral compass, does he have the cognitive abilities in your mind to be president of the United States? I, d I don't think he has the, uh, the character to be president of the United States. 
And I've often said, and, and I don't mean it as an exaggeration, that you could pluck someone off the street and they'd be a better president. And I say that because if you pluck somebody off the street at random, they would be patriotic, they would be decent, and they would have the common sense to know that if they didn't know someone something, they should find someone who did. These are qualities all lacking in the president. And, um, but I think what has our republic really shaking right now is not that the president lacks these, the, the, the essential uh, element of character, but rather that my GOP colleagues are so willing to fall in line no matter how serious the depravity. Uh, you know, we had a, a resolution on the floor today to um, urge the complaint to be provided to the Congress. Uh, you know, this would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. Yesterday, when we took it up on the Rules Committee, um, the Republican representative of the Intel Committee said it's premature. Um, we shouldn't ask for the complaint until the director comes in and tells us why he's not giving it to us. And then today, he argued it's post-mature, because now they've agreed to provide it. So it's premature, post-mature, it's apparently never mature <laughs> for Congress to insist that the law be obeyed. Um, and when I listen to my colleagues just tie themselves into knots to explain how this obvious shakedown on this call was some, somehow nothing to see there, right. you know, I was reminded once again, as we've been reminded over the last two and a half years, that there is no depth to which they will not go to avoid being tweeted at by the president, uh, attacked by his cronies uh, on Fox. Oh, you can testify that you can get tweeted at the president and survive. Yes. In fact, I have to tell you, because I thought this was quite hilarious. I didn't get a chance to watch the president's press conference today. So I, I missed that show. Um, but one of my staff came in right after it was over, and he said, the president just called you smart. Um, and I said, really? And he said, yeah, but then he said, you lie and lie and lie. And I was like, you kind of buried the lead there. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I can attest the fact you can be attacked by the president, you can survive it. And I, obviously it's different as a Democrat, but a great many of my Republican colleagues could stand up to this president and their constituents would applaud them for it. Uh, I remember a conversation I had actually at a forum I think that you and I participated in when Senator McCain and I were backstage. This was before the midterms, and I said, I don't understand why there's not a single Republican in the House who feels they have a constituency to be the, be the John McCain of the House. I would think that's a good place for any number of my GOP colleagues to be. And his response was, well, if it stays that way, they'll soon be calling you chairman. Um, and obviously it did. Um, and, you know, while I'm glad that I'm the chairman and not the ranking member, um, I would prefer that my Republican colleagues did the right thing. Yes. Um, and while I understand at a very kind of pedestrian level why they don't, they, they're worried about a primary, they're worried about their future career plans, at another level I don't understand at all. What's, what's the point of their being there? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously you're, you know many of your Republican colleagues fairly well. You're probably friends with some of them. Um, and, and I want to just press on this point. You know, you read the, you read the transcript, as it's been called, um, and it is not, it is not um, I will not give you money unless you dig up this dirt and send it to me in this post office box. It's a little bit more vague, at least in the description. Is there any possibility that someone could read what you've read in a slightly more benign manner and give the president the benefit of the doubt? Uh, it depends, I guess, on what you're drinking or smoking. Um, I don't know how you can read that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how any of them could read that. And if they didn't know there was an R next to the president's name instead of a D, um, that they could reach any conclusion other than this man is corrupt. You said it reads like a, a mob shakedown. Go into that a bit. Uh, it does. And, you know, I, I'm continually reminded of something James Comey said a year or two ago about how when he was asked by the president, uh, can't you see fit to let this Flynn thing go? He didn't need to be told this was a directive. 
when the commander in chief says that he hopes something happens, it means I want you to make it so. Um, that the president speaks in Comey's experience like an organized crime figure. Now, I've got my issues with James Comey, but not on this score. Because time and time again, we see this is exactly how the president talks. Uh, Michael Cohen talked about it as well, how the president would talk in code. And you read that call record, it's got everything you'd expect from a mob boss. It's got, um, you know, we do a lot for you. We do a lot for you. We do more for you than any other country does for you. But there's not much reciprocity here. Um, there's not much reciprocity. And uh, I got a favor I want to ask of you. Um, and let me just say, Ukraine's a nice country. Um, it's kind of like, it'd be sad if something happened to it. Like, like nobody defended you from Russia invading your soil. Uh, you don't need to club the president of Ukraine over the head. The president of Ukraine goes into that call knowing I am totally dependent on this country against a powerful and malignant neighbor. Um, I'm dependent militarily, I'm dependent diplomatically, I'm dependent economically. Um, his, his court gesture of a lawyer has made it clear what he wants even before this meeting. Um, my staff has certainly told me exactly what the president wants. And the president makes, wastes no time in getting to the point um, and goes back to it and back to it and back to it. Um, Ukraine is not stupid and neither are we. Um, it's clear what's going on here. And uh, if you're going to look for the president or anyone else to spell it out in graphic terms, like I think any good organized crime figure, they know how to talk in a way where the message is clear and the threat is implied. Is he, um, is he Michael Corleone or is he Fredo? <laughs> I always no. thought Don Jr. was a dead ringer for Fredo, um, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, uh... Michael wouldn't get caught with a transcript. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, I guess these days you have to laugh or you'd go mad, but this is a terrible tragedy for the country. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned John McCain earlier, and um, I had the chance to travel with him uh, to a couple of security, national security conferences. And at one of them, um, and the wonderful thing about traveling with him is he could invite anyone to dinner and they'd come. We had dinner with Bono and Bill Gates. And um, as the night wore on, uh, we started telling jokes, and Bono told a joke about being Irish, and then got very serious, and he said, I'm very proud to be Irish, I'm very proud of Ireland, but Ireland, like most countries, is just a country. America is also an idea. And I remember thinking at the time that this is really what's at stake right now, the idea of America. But, but I thought a lot about that conversation over the last two years. And, and for much of those two years, I thought about that conversation in the context of the idea of America as the bastion of democracy, as the champion of human rights, uh, as the as the torch for freedom-loving people all around the world. But I've come to realize there's another part of the American idea that is also now so deeply at risk. And that's the idea of America as a melting pot, uh, the idea of America as a place that's welcoming of refugees, uh, that, um, that you can come to, that you can belong in. Um, and when the president tells my colleagues to go back to where they came from, and inspires crowds to make that hideous chant, you realize everything about the American idea is at risk right now. And that I don't think uh, you can capture well in a, uh, in a movie role. Right. So my last, my last question for you is a large question. But you know, as a representative of Hollywood, I always appreciate the opportunity oh. to cast people. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. The, um, the large question, maybe it's the largest question, is is this a political crisis, a moral crisis, or is it a constitutional crisis? We're here to talk about the Constitution. Is the Constitution, constitutional norms, constitutional uh, behavior, is, it, are we, is this under threat? 
in some way, the, the subject that is the preoccupation of the National Constitution Center, of a lot of people in Washington and beyond? Well, I think it's really all three. It's certainly a moral crisis uh, when so much of the, the values of the country are being tested. Uh, what does the country stand for? What Do we still stand for what it says on the Statute of Liberty, or, or are we some different country now? So morally, we're being tested. Politically, um, our system is showing enormous um, strain. Lots of things we thought were inviolate norms turn out you can violate with near impunity. Um, whether we're in a constitutional crisis, I've always thought that we'll be in that crisis when the courts finally adjudicate against the Trump administration vis-a-vis uh, -vis the oversight we're doing. And Donald Trump says what I think President Jackson said once before when the Supreme Court ruled against him, well, that's your opinion, now let's see you enforce it. If we ever get to that point, we are in a full-blown crisis because there is no one and nowhere to appeal. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but I do think, well, the framers um, conceived that a, a man like Donald Trump might become president. I think they had more confidence in the Congress and its willingness to, when the Constitution itself was at stake, overlook party interests and do what was right. And in that respect, they may have overestimated. Well, let me, let me follow that up with a final question because you, you're, you're, you're forcing me to ask this question. Do you, if the president ever said to the Supreme Court, to a Supreme Court ruling, well, that's your opinion, go enforce it. How much faith do you have that your Republican colleagues in the House would say, okay, that's the red line. Thank you very much. This, this whole thing is over. And how, much, and how much faith do you have that they would do that, or do you doubt whether people would rise to that? It's very difficult for me to see the circumstances in which um, this current crop of representatives is willing to stand up to the president. Um, I think what we've learned uh, is the flip side of something we knew, and that is we knew that courage was contagious. During the presidency of Donald Trump, we've learned that so is cowardice. Um, and there's a kind of a group think going on um, where if no one speaks out, no one speaks out. Uh, and no one was, is speaking out with any conviction right now in the GOP. Um, and therefore, no one is speaking out. And you know, after time after time where we thought, okay, surely now, uh, only to be disappointed, I've given up any expectation of that changing. But you know, I do want to say, so that we don't end on such a gloomy note, I also have very confidence we're going to get through this. I think the country's been through far worse. Um, we've been through far greater uh, times of division, and nothing was worse than the Civil War. Um, but even Vietnam, I think, were far more profound divisions and far more deadly divisions than today. Um, so we're going to get through this. Um, there are certain things that will be an indelible blight even when we do get through it. Uh, what we've done to these migrant families uh, will be, I think, the darkest stain um, on our country. Um, some damage can't be mitigated. A, a, a family, a parent that has lost their child, um, whose child has died, is never going to get that child back. And, but I do believe that when we have a new president, they can quickly mitigate much of the damage. And the size of the repudiation at the polls next year is going to be very important uh, in telling the rest of the country um, whether this was a bout of momentary insanity or something far more serious. Um, and maybe more importantly, in telling ourselves in reminding ourselves uh, that the country is much better than this, um, that this president, this presidency, these collective failures in Congress, um, that we're better than this, and we're going to demand better in the future. Congressman Schiff, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Please welcome back Erite Weiler. 
thank you so much to all of our speakers and our moderators, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Does anyone else have high blood pressure after that last hour and a half? <laughs> I definitely do. Um, please join us after this for uh, an evening with Yo-Yo Ma happening on the idea stage. Seems like a great opportunity to calm after this last hour and a half. Thank you, everyone.